I work on uh, chapter two, um, One God. And I'm using the little monitor one so I can actually be sure I show you the right stuff and as we go along. Um, I listened to the recording of Paul you know, talking last Sunday and I know he covered uh, some of uh, some detail of the uh, the gods of uh, the of the Canaanite gods and all. I, I want to start out since she does in this chapter with a little bit about those those gods again, just to kind of set a background because I think it's important to understand that um, the Jews, the Israelis, did not become monothe- monotheistic uh, overnight. Uh, it was a, a gradual process and it was somewhat of a difficult process too. Uh, so let's let's talk for a second about the pagan gods. They're, they were personal. They dealt with uh, the unexplainable that they made explainable and included gods of fertility and maternity, uh, sun and storm, healing and uh, water and grain, love, afterlife. Gods for each of these uh, different areas to help explain, again, what was to the people at that time unexplainable. The pagan gods depended on sacrificial ceremonies and elaborate temples uh, to renew their power. And I think Paul mentioned last Sunday that even included the the sacrifice of the firstborn, which which was meant to replenish the power uh, of of the god. And that's why we have the the uh, occurrence in the Bible in the Old Testament of um, Abraham um, being willing to sacrifice his son to the God Yahweh. And um, by the way, before I go any further, I, there's so much in this chapter that what I tried to do is pick and choose the information that would create some kind of a continuity um, that would provide some view of how the views of the of the Israelites of the Jews changed over time uh, as their circumstances changed. So, so it leads right into the next point, which is the God of Israel had originally distinguished himself because he revealed himself in concrete events. And the most classic example of that to the, to the minds of the uh, the early Jews would be um, no uh, would be. Noah and the flood, and Moses escaping Egypt uh, with the aid of God. Uh, so in those ways, involved himself very specifically in the events of, of humans. Um, there are several pagan gods of Israel and their neighbors. And I, I bring these up because these gods were the same gods that ended up being in the Jewish temples. Uh, and that uh, many of the prophets at different periods in time uh, railed against because of their uh, belief in a one God, and yet there were these pagan idols within the temple. Baal, you've heard mentioned many times, meant to be, and it's interesting, think of the the terms we use for God and for Jesus, that uh, he was the God of fertility, he was called the prince, uh, lord of the earth. We talk about the prince of peace. So there's that e- equation. Uh, he was also the lord of rain and dew, or the storm god. And that covered the two forms of moisture that are indispensable for cultivation in Canaan. Uh, he's also called the lord of, he- of heaven, the lord of the heavens. Uh, again, very similar to... Uh, the god of the Israelites. Marduk was uh, the chief Babylonian deity, uh, and his, uh, his role was fertility and vegetation. Dagon was a Phoenician and Philistine god of agriculture, uh, and sometimes referred to as the god of wheat and grain, or I'm sorry, of water and grain. Uh, and uh, he's often described by his followers as, as the king, Now we go to the God of Abraham, and I'm 
again, I'm going to try to not necessarily go in the order of the chronological order of the book, but go in the order of the transformation of the Jews in their view of God. So the God of Abraham and Abraham born and all these, all these dates, by the way, are going to be tentative. You, you can, I, I found some that he say he was born in uh, 1996 BCE, meaning the before the common era. And I find others that vary by a year or two, a decade or so uh, it's all guesswork. So, but it at least gives us some kind of a chronological range of each of uh, the views of, of God. So Abraham referred to uh, God as El Shaddai. That was the name of God. But it's also interesting that El, part of that, was the name of the Canaanite God. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, Mam, Mamre uh, as he sat at the entrance of the tent, tent in the heat of the day. That's from Genesis 18, 1 and 2. Talks about three men standing near him. Um, what's interesting is that that basically says that God is very visible, very personal, um, will ap appear to men and women, primarily men, uh, in this particular uh, very masculine uh, religion or time. Uh, and yet, it's interesting that um, the author says an account in an encounter with God is an encounter with a personage, unlike the spiritual practice described in the Upanishads. Uh, I knew I was going to mess this up. Uh, Upanishads. Um, they, this would have been inconceivable to the sages of the Vega because they uh, viewed a dialogue or meeting with Brahman Atman as inappropriate. It was not. Um, they couldn't envision God in a man's form. Uh, Brahman Atman was something that you would attain, a spirit that you would attain uh, that pervaded all things. It was not a human humanoid type form. So we go from Abraham, who basically, according to Genesis, sat down with God and talked with God, to the God of Moses. And this is where Yahweh Sabaoth, uh, Lord of hosts, the God of armies, or often called the God of angel armies, came into play. Um, again, it's, it's a very militaristic God, a God we would refer to it as a God of vengeance. And the God of Moses would have cast the Assyrians as the enemies uh, in 74 BCE. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit by saying this, um, but Isaiah, Isaiah cast the Syrian army in the role of instruments of God. So in other words, the difference is Moses would have seen God as an instrument of, the, of his people. He would never have seen God as, um, as being on the side of the, other, of the enemy. God of Joshua, Gideon, and King David, uh, God had captained the armies of Joshua and Gideon and King David. He had led them to victories. He was basically a warrior god. So we've gone from uh, a god for everything, whether it be fertility or war or whatever, to a single god who is a warrior god. But that old idolatry has not disappeared. Uh, later, he captained the armies of Israel and Judah's enemies, which, again, <clears throat> would have been inconceivable for, for Joshua and Gideon and King David. All three, the author says, all three of the monotheistic faiths has de have developed similar theologies of election at different times in their history, sometimes with uh, even more devastating results than those imagined in the book of Joshua. Okay, so what, is, what does the author mean by election? And what are those devastating results that she's talking about? What's election? 
the idea that you are a chosen people and no one else matters much. Okay. And what were the devastating results of that view in the book of Joshua? Massacre. Okay. So we have gone from a very personal God to a warrior God who protects his chosen people. And the author says, um, we know little of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the judges, though doubtless a good deal of blood was shed. The bloodshed had been given a religious uh, rationale. The dangers of such theologies of election, which are not qualified by compassion, are shared by Amos and Isaiah, are clearly shown in the holy wars that have scarred the history of monotheism. Now, let me be sure you understand that sentence, or that long sentence. She's saying that those dangers of, of election, of the theologies of election, were not shared or were at least qualified by compassion by Amos and Isaiah. So that's a, that's a slight change from the time of, of Joshua. Comments so far? The Joshua, holy so, wars, the holy ahead. wars, pardon me. The holy wars don't seem to be uh, centralized only in Christianity. You know, we have now the the uh, more radical arm of Islam that you know they want to slaughter Americans and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there's an awful lot of bloodshed in the name of of religion all over the world. Well, and again, the author would say that Islam, being another one of the three major monotheistic religions, has uh, gone through a time period of where they talk, consider themselves the, the elect, the chosen, and that that has been used as the justification for um, acts of violence against other people. Well, and let's be honest, too, it's not just Islam. We have fanatical Christians in this country um, who feel the same way about the Muslims and the Jews sure. and the blacks and anybody who's not white Christian. Sure. Well, we are a nation that believes in American yeah, exceptionalism. Kind of right? Yeah, and and doesn't that stuff. then lead to a view of us being elect or select or chosen, which means we can do no wrong and other nations must bow to our will. Is that overstating it? I don't think you're overstating what some people believe. I think, I, I think that's true. Well, going back to Joshua, it says at the time Joshua came and wiped out the Anakim, from the hill country, from Hebron, and it goes on to name other places, Joshua utterly destroyed them with their towns. None of the Anakim was left in the land of the Israelites. Who are the Anakim? Ever hear of giants? I think it's like the Philistines, isn't it? It, it would be they were considered giants. And so um, Joshua felt called by God to wipe them out and uh, did it in many places. Uh, and following up on that exclusive, exclusive or exclusion and exceptionalism, uh, already it's mentioned that the 11th and 12th century crusaders justified wars against Jews and Muslims because they were the new chosen people. And the Calvinist the theologies of election are largely instrumental in encouraging Americans to believe that they are God's own nat nation. What's wrong with that? An anything? Are we not God's own nation? It's so, it's just so egotistical. <laughs> Americans have always done this. We think that we, that we uh, um, have the, the best 
in everything, you know, science and math and everything. It's like, there's just a central egotism to our country that I must admit I've had too, you know, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, but it's, it's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> and other countries can feel the same way that, that they're God's own nation. Sure. Of course. American exceptionalism in part can be traced to the American uh, Puritan roots. I don't know how many of you have thought about that, that they came here um, and um, across, they had a transatlantic uh, exodus like the pilgrims, uh, saw themselves as participants in, in this uh, millennial kingdom that God would create. And it was a very um, uh, closed, closed group. People, only the people who believe the way they believed. Now you can look at the American Indians and violence and conquest by the Puritans and the pilgrims. Yeah. I just uh, finished reading a little book that talked about what Karen mentioned was that, and the author said, uh, the Puritans and Others came to America to escape uh, the intolerance in Europe. And when they got here, they encountered uh, the Indian people who were open and accepting, but they, they themselves became intolerant of the Indians <laughs> and their own religious beliefs. They even went after the people who became Quakers. Uh, didn't like them. Right. Well, and let's not forget that Joseph Smith was, he created a religion out of that same concept. And I grew up thinking we were elite, one true church. I don't know how many times I learned that we were the one true church because we had all three books. We had the entire gospel. So we were the, the chosen ones. I learned that in my childhood Bible school. I think a great many religious beliefs kind of box people in to the point that you think there's nothing that you can learn from someone else that has a different cultural perspective or religious perspective. And I don't know, there's, there are little things to pick up from all kinds of religious experience that maybe will enrich us. But we tend to think that those people over there couldn't possibly have any light to shed on this topic. I think it can get even closer to home. How many times as a parent do we think that we can't learn anything from our kids and our children think they can't learn anything from us? Mm -hmm. Now, those are temporary times, of course, then they realize the wisdom of, of their elders. <laughs> But it still occurs. I mean, it, there's a natural tendency to think that our perspective on the world is the one and only correct perspective. And, uh, and yet, if you are open, you find that belief constantly battered and, and altered. Well, in Josiah's kingdom of Judah, such a belief is likely to flourish as a, at a time of political insecurity. So again, these are the words from the, the author. She is saying, that in Josiah's time, um, there was a in political insecurity. The people were haunted by fear of their own destruction. And therefore, they viewed themselves as being protected by God as the chosen people. Uh, and it was easier to uh, destroy their enemies than to try to understand the variety of cultures, the variety of beliefs. Um, and I thought this was an interesting quote from the book because it we're gonna we keep talking about the prophets and uh, she says uh, primarily the prophet is one who stands in God's presence, but this experience of transcendence results not in the imparting of knowledge, as in the Buddhism, as in Buddhism, but in action. You agree? Well, it seems that most of the Old Testament prophets 
when they have something to say, they're telling the people there's something they need to do, not just meditate. You know, they, they seem to be very action oriented in the Old Testament. About something the people should do or some other action would occur. And I, I probably should have said the role of the Old Testament prophet, because I do think that we have gotten to a point, I hope, I hope we're not too, um, too, many, have too many blinders on. I think we've got to a point where our prophet does, in fact, uh, impart knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, and and passion. Yes. I, I want to go back just for a minute, back to the, the elect idea. Sure. And there's something going on in, in our country right now that basically adopts that belief, but it's really dangerous, and that's white supremacist. They basically believe in an elect group, the white people have a destiny to be in charge of the world, I think. So to me, that's that's a version of election and has really dangerous consequences. Well, and it is it not kind of a derivative of uh, Nazi Germany, where those members in the party, the blue-eyed blondes, the pure Aryans, were the ones who should rule and others serve them. Well, that's true, but that it existed long before the Nazis were here. Uh, I just well, finished a book about um, uh, the great dissenter, uh, Judge Chief uh, Supreme Court Justice Harlan and his dissent in various uh, Supreme Court decisions. And a lot of those revolve around uh, uh, white supremacism and, you know, the doctrine of Plessy versus Ferguson about separate but equal and those kind of decisions. So, Well, we can go back to, to Judah and see that when Joseph Messiah's kingdom, uh, he held that view um, that they needed to, to weed out all the idols and all the uh, opponents of uh, Yahweh. Yeah. Doesn't this all go back all the way to Cain and Abel? That, uh, you know, when one killed the other, you know, that was a mark was put on him and skin was turned dark and, you know, he was he was damned basically forever. And I think it goes all the way back to that. Some of the, some of the beliefs that the Aryan peoples or the blonde and pure were God's chosen. Well, let's not forget even the Book of Mormon has that fallacy. Yes. Right. So it was put on the sons of Laban. And the meek of the earth still cry out, why can't we all just get along? (laughs) Another quote from the book, the prophet will not be characterized by mystical illumination, but by obedience. And again, we're talking about that time period of everything from Moses to Joshua uh, to the early, the early prophets in the Old Testament. That it, it wasn't a matter of uh, illumination or knowledge, but rather of obedience to the will of God. And then sharing that information, uh, commanding the people on behalf of God to straighten up your act. So let's talk about the next prophet who, who kind of forms a, a transition uh, from that uh, God of war, that God of vengeance, uh, to a slightly different God. And it, even Isaiah is not, does not do away with that, uh, that concept entirely. But, but we have to understand Isaiah's world. They're always on the verge of war. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah would have lived to see the destruction of the northern kingdom, which was Israel, Uh, and the deportation of uh, 10 tribes. And that's where we get the whole concept of the lost 10 tribes of Israel. In 701 BCE, 
Uh, Sennacherib would invade Judah with a vast Assyrian army, lay siege to uh, 46 cities and fortresses and impale defenders, uh, defenders uh, officers and all on poles, deport about 2,000 people and imprison the Jewish king Hezekiah in Jerusalem, quote, like a bird in a cage. So again, we're, we're talking about the mindset that affects Isaiah the environment in which he begins his prophesying uh, is, is, lab- is all, always uh, tinted or flavored by being in this chaotic you know, situation. And it's interesting or important at this point to point out that there are really, uh, there's a multi-author theory of Isaiah and um, fundamentalists will argue with this. Uh, more liberal theo- theologians will support it and of course, there's a vast middle ground that are not quite sure. So um, the multi-author theory says that there are three Isaiahs. The first Isaiah from chapters 1 to 39 faced the Assyrian threat and saw history as a divine warning. In other words, what was happening to Israel uh, was a warning. It's a warning to his people. So God is actively saying, hey, look what can happen to you. Second Isaiah starts with chapter 40, goes through the 55th, and it's written uh, during the Babylonian exile, and it made history generate new hope for the future. So this Isaiah, the second one, has um, more of a hopeful view of the future. And the third Isaiah chapters 55 to 66, written about the time of the return, which would be 520 to 516 BCE. Um, And this is kind of a quote from part of uh, a couple of those chapters. It says, uh, told the the people to maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and set the oppressed free, break every yoke, share your food with the hungry, and provide the poor wanderer with shelter. So if you, ha- I don't know if you've seen, if you feel that shift, but there's a shift from God will take care of us, he'll destroy our enemies, to God wants us to do just. He wants us to be just, to take care of the poor, the needy, the wanderer. And back again to the world being in disarray at the time of Isaiah. The God of Israel had originally distinguished himself from pagan deities by revealing himself in concrete current events, not simply in mythology and liturgy. And I've used that quote a little earlier. <clears throat> but now the new prophets, and it include, includes people like Isaiah, second Isaiah, and Hosea, uh, insisted political catastrophe as well as victory revealed the God who is becoming the Lord and master of history. What does that mean? No idea. I, I think it means that God is more than just tribal, that he's that he's like over all of creation now. If you believe that God will protect you no matter what, and you are a Jew in this in this time period, and all of a sudden the Assyrians come in of the Persians and the Assyrians and the Egyptians, and you're constantly bombarded with these major nations taking care of, taking over your area. You only have two, two options, right? One is that God is the master of history and all this is for a purpose. Or the second is that you become a very evil people and therefore you deserve everything you're getting. So I suspect that the prophets felt somewhere between the two of those, those extremes. Stop me at any time if you have some comments. So back to the God of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of Judea, which is the Southern kingdom. 
He prays in the temple, uh, has a vision of Yahweh sitting on his celestial throne. And it, the author talks about how that celestial throne seemed to, or maybe I should do it the other way, that the temple mimicked the celestial throne of God. And that's in Isaiah 6. And that was about 742 BCE. He sees um, God as, as some fiery being. Here's the seraphim cry, holy, holy, holy. And we have always, I have always viewed that as meaning uh, divine, perfect, etc. The author says the Hebrew word kadash means otherness or a radical separation. So I don't know if that changes your view of, of the scripture or not. And goes on, the author goes on to kind of summarize what Isaiah said, which is that Yahweh was utterly revolted by the animal sacrifices in the temple, sickened by the fat of calves, blood of bulls and goats, and the reeking blood that smoked from the holocausts. He could not bear their festivals, New Year celebrations, uh, ceremonies, and pilgrimages. This would have shocked Israel's audience. I'm sorry, shocked Isaiah's audience. Uh, in the Middle East, these cultic celebrations were of the essence of religion. And, and that also, for, up till Jesus' time, they were still doing sacrifices. So I find that kind of interesting even though he's revolted by sacrifices. But again, this, this God is saying, this version of their God, as they perceive him, is saying, I don't want sacrifices anymore. While pagan gods demanded ceremonies and elaborate temples to renew their power, Yahweh was saying these thing, those things, sacrifices and magnificent temples are meaningless. The God Yahweh wanted compassion rather than sacrifice. So you see again the shift. Uh, prior to that, and even during the time of Isaiah, not, not a lot of people listened to him, but during the time of Isaiah and earlier, they would have felt as if the, uh, the sacrifices in the temple and uh, their prayers in the temple were all that was required for them to be a chosen people. Isaiah said, uh, on behalf of God, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Do you, do you see how a 360 degree turn that is for, for the people of, of Israel? Well, I think it would be a very dramatic shift in viewpoint in that day and time. Um, as one of your previous slides said, you know, the, the, pagan religions, you know, the, the ritual of it all, going to the temple and making a sacrifice or whatever, that was it. That's what you did. Uh, I don't know if anything else was required of you once you completed your temple activities. And I think God is shifting here in their understanding that he requires, a, you know, behavioral changes, not just temple duties. Is there any comparison between that and uh, RLDS uh, practice of a few decades ago where you went to church every Sunday morning, you went to church a uh, preaching service every Sunday night, you went to Wednesday evening service, you paid your tithing, and you're A-OK? -okay? Well, I think that's always been the problem with religion is, is people thought those acts while not bad in themselves, that that was it. And it didn't necessarily affect your behavior once you left the building.
I, I would agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. It's, it's um, not what you do when you're inside the temple. It's what you do when you're outside the temple and how you treat others. And, and, you know, what is your, your walk of life uh, when you're, when you're not observing the Sabbath, the other six days of the week. You know, to piggyback on what Sharon said, you, you think of religions that have confession. You, you can pretty much do whatever during the week. And as, it, as long it reminds as you're me in confession, you can. It reminds me of a story, and I, I am going to mangle it, but hopefully you get the general idea. And it talks about a police officer who, who pulls over. Uh, a driver and the driver has a bumper sticker that says uh, honk if you love Jesus and uh, other sayings that clearly are Christian oriented. And uh, the driver says, why did you pull me over? And he said, well, you gave the finger to that driver back there who cut you off. You did this and that, all the kinds of things that the bumper stickers would in indicate you shouldn't be doing or wouldn't be doing. So the story, if I haven't mangled it too badly, is simply that Sometimes our actions don't match our, our beliefs, don't match our faith. I actually had a car with something like that on the back of it cut me off the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought of that story. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we talk about the prophets and um, the author wants to make it clear that um, they have attributed their own human feelings and experiences to Yahweh. Now, the prophets were in an important sense creating a God in their own image. Now you can argue with that language, but um, I think we've always believed that even in our church, the prophet is influenced by his experiences and that he reflects his interaction with the divine. Uh, you know, Basically, uh, Isaiah, uh, a member of the royal family, was, has seen Yahweh as a king. Amos uh, had ascribed his empathy with the suffering poor to Yahweh and uh, saw Yahweh, as, and, and uh, Hosea saw Yahweh as a jilted husband who still uh, continued to feel a yearning tenderness for his wife. Why, why would Hosea say that? Why would that reflect Hosea's? view of God. Well, Hosea, wasn't he the one whose wife was Gomer? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm so glad we did Richard Brown's book before this one, because it gave me a good quick review of some of the Old Testament prophets that I had kind of gotten rusty on. And uh, Hosea suffered a lot of turmoil in his private life, so he would identify uh, Yahweh is a jilted husband. Yeah, exactly. And by jilted husband, uh, Hosea means that Israel has forsaken uh, uh, God, has walked away, has been unfaithful, uh, just as Gomer uh, had been unfaithful to Hosea. Amos, like, uh, let's talk about the God of Amos now, and we're, we're moving generally through history, but at the same time, uh, Amos and Isaiah are pretty much contemporary, only one, only different kingdoms. Amos, like Jeremiah after him, was drafted by Yahweh to deliver a message. Amos said, the lion roars, who can help feeling afraid? The Lord Yahweh speaks, who can refuse to prophesy? So Amos, like many of the other prophets, um, uh, Jeremiah, I think, is the one I think of specifically, were just uh, fearful of, of speaking on behalf of God. Uh, Amos, a contemporary of Isaiah, was the first prophet to emphasize social ju justice and compassion. Amos is in the north and Isaiah in the south. Um, so Amos is up in Israel and Isaiah is in Judah. Amos's experience as divine messenger is recorded in the eighth chapter of, of Amos. And 
it talks about him going into the, the uh, temple at Bethel and uh, the, the priest accuses him. He starts, he starts prophesying and the priest accuses him of being a fortune teller. And so basically Amos says, um, this is what the sovereign God showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked, a basket of ripe fruit. I answered, then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere, silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? Skimping on the measures, boosting the price, and cheating the dishonest with, with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the grain, with the wheat. I remember that the Israelites were, they were supposed to share uh, what was left over after they harvested the wheat. The, so the sweepings, the leftover should have been gone to the poor. The Lord has sworn by himself, the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will be rise like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. Uh, in that day, by the way, that seems to be an allusion back to uh, Moses crossing the river and the, you know, uh, the river swamping the, uh, the Pharaoh's armies as they follow. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. So the point of that long scripture and that long reading is in that middle part where it really talks about God being Yahweh, being uh, upset with the Jews, uh, basically taking advantage of the poor. That's probably the quickest way I can summarize it. Comments? Correct me if I'm wrong, Jonathan, but wasn't Amos the shepherd that, yes. that he said that, that, you know, he was being accused of being, you know, um, like a terrible prophet and elitist. But he said, wait a minute, I came from kind of that that lower group of people. So he, he felt like he had something to say. Isaiah and... Amos were almost at opposite ends of the spectrum, but had the same message. Isaiah was an aristocrat. Isaiah was a shepherd and tended fig trees um, and was called, they both were called on to deliver this message of compassion as opposed to God being a vengeful God who would protect them no matter what. I think it's interesting that Amos uses this uh, natural phenomenon, natural phenomena um, to express what the, uh, God's going to do, first an earthquake and then an eclipse, basically. Yeah. And it says something about what people understood in those days uh, when those things happened, that um, God was taking a hand in that and causing it to happen uh, because of displeasure or something. Yeah, I think it's interesting that throughout the, the Old Testament, um, the prophets even never get too far away from the concept that there's a God of thunder. There's a God of uh, fertility. There's a God of this and a God of that. I mean, may, they may talk about Yahweh, but they have compressed all those gods into this one Yahweh. Uh, and there's still a feeling that he controls everything, everything that happens. Uh, the Israelites uh, continue on with the God of Amos. The Israelites, like their neighbors to the south, the Judeans, thought they were God's chosen people. They had entirely misunderstood the nature of the covenant, which means resp meant responsibility, not privilege. I thought that was the key message of this chapter. After reading 50 or 60 pages, and I got to that line, and I thought, okay, this sums it up. <laughs> I, and I... 
I agree. I think that is the, the essence of, of the message. Unfortunately, most Israelites declined the prophet's warning and refused to enter into what the author calls the a dialogue with Yahweh. Uh, they pref preferred the less demanding forms of religion, uh, which basically uh, the old cults of uh, the, the pagan gods and the cults of Canaan. This continues to be the case. Uh, this can, that's, let me read this correctly. This continues to be the case. The religion of compassion is followed only by a minority. Most religious people are content with decorous worship in synagogue, church, temple, and mosque. Now that's the author speaking. So she just insulted all of you. What do you say to that? I think it is often true. I think we often need to think about that. And are we doing more than just the outward trappings of our belief? Are we actually participating in, you know, doing good deeds outside of the building? I think that's, that's the key. Um, that, and I, th I think that Latter-day Saintism, the Restoration Theology, has always said, now whether we practice it or not, you know, it's always said that our religious life is just part of our whole life, that our tithing is not just money, it's over our entire time, talent, and resources, and that, in fact, uh, we are, are called to be a people we just don't go to church on Sunday morning, but who actually incorporate that into our daily lives. Now, again, that's always been the challenge. Now, whether we've lived up to that is kind of an individual judgment. The, the flip side of that is also, we are a chosen people and only those that live within whatever circle of independence will end up in heaven. <laughs> Well, you know, when we all were into the three glories, uh, three levels of the glories, that was almost like a bribe to get people to do good. Yep, I agree. Nobody wanted to be just in the telestial or terrestrial glory. You wanted the celestial. <laughs> you got to have that celestial badge. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Any other responses to this insult to all of us? <laughs> I don't know. Billy Joel said he'd rather cry with or laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints because the sinners were a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> also, after I um, toured the Mormon temple, the celestial room looked way too clean. It was all white. I don't want to live in a place that it's all white. <laughs> That was just the gateway. Oh, well. There's, there's color on the other side. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> My sister and I always shot for the middle one because we didn't think we could make it to the celestial. <laughs> I'm with you, Jane, as a quilter. I, I have to have color. <laughs> well, is that what the millennials are saying more or less by <clears throat> what I read anyway is that they're more interested in, in action than um, right. decorous worship, I guess you'd say. I suspect that is. Um, <clears throat> I think they're, I can't speak for the millennials, but uh, I suspect that they also feel as if, uh, if God is everywhere, they don't need to go to church to worship God. Uh, if they, if God is everywhere, they don't have to follow certain religious uh, dictums in order to uh, be with God, understand God, worship God. But that's and I, just think, I think they've also seen us sitting in church and then not doing anything later. And um, they're not, they're, they're capable of making that connection. You realize how difficult this all is because we're told to 
uh, be generous and do things and not let our left hand know what our right hand's doing. So we're not supposed to boast about what we're doing. And yet, uh, how do we influence people unless they see what we're doing? And you also notice that Amos gave this, or the time of Amos was 780 to 760 BC. I, I guess we haven't gotten the message yet. When Cassie uh, visited our church, you know, as a post post college days, um, she was just very, very um, critical. And one thing that she said that stuck with me is, "Don't you guys like each other? You don't even sit next to each other. Everyone was all spread out." And um, that's always kind of stuck with me. So um, I've always tried to sit by somebody. Um, but when you're talking about the millennials, what their perception is, yes, they, they want action. And I think belonging to a small church, we are more in tune to action because there's not a lot of people that pick up the slack if we don't. And so um, we are pretty good about the action, but um, we can do better after COVID is over, <laughs> to right. sit by each other, to give the, um, the feeling of community and that we like each other and yada, yada, yada. Good point. I, I often <laughs> think of the hymn, what does the Lord require of me? Uh, you know, seek justice, love kindness, etc. cetera. And I, I, I just try to live that a little bit. And I think that's, what my view here is of, uh, of some of this would be. But I think the religious hypocrites, you know, as we study this, it is age old. How do you, how do you go to war and kill people in the name of religion? How do you go to church on Sunday and walk out on Monday morning and be ugly to your employees? Uh, so I, I think that religious hypocrite is a well-deserved name, unfortunately. That's a good point. Well, King Josiah uh, talked about the dangers of an idolatrous religiosity. Uh, it become, became clear in about 622 BCE during the reign of King Josiah. He uh, he was the king of Judah. Uh, he was anxious to reverse the syn syncret, syncret, I can't even say it. Synchristic. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> the basically, it's just a fusion of, of different belief systems, and often the fusion of belief systems that actually are contradictory to each other. So uh, his predecessors, in essence, what, he, what they're saying is that his predecessors um, accepted Yahweh, but they also accepted all these other uh, uh, Canaanite gods into the temple and had literally uh, statues and, and uh, altars for the other gods. And kind of an interesting side uh, is that uh, the author mentioned uh, Azareth, who was uh, for some of the, the Jews identified as the, the wife of God, the wife of Yahweh. Uh, so the only point in mentioning that is you can see that they were still struggling with separating out that uh, polytheism from monotheism. Uh, from their, They struggled with having one God. Uh, somehow or other, they had to pull in these others uh, within the temple and, and within their, their lives. Everybody always wants to hedge their bet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, King Josiah um, really believed in a, a jealous God. And so uh, he, and he's often referred to as the last righteous king of Judah. Anybody know why? Uh. Went through and he cleansed the temple. I mean, he basically went through uh, and uh, got rid of the the uh, 
sacred carvings and idols and, and uh, demolish the altars of the, the idols and the other gods. Uh, and in the process, he also killed a number of people who uh, the priests of the other, other gods. So he, he was trying to cleanse the, the temple. And the reason for it, he believed, was that God was a jealous God. And that Israel, Judah, would suffer, in his case, Judah, would suffer uh, if it didn't cleanse the temple of, of all these other gods. And the author says, this wholesale destruction springs from a hatred that is rooted in buried anxiety and fear. Does that make sense to you? If your God is a, a jealous God, and some of the people, some of the priests are in fact allowing uh, altars for other gods in the temple, and he's a jealous God, what do you think, what do you think he's going to do? Destroy the people? Uh, disperse the people? destroy the nation. And so the author is saying that that, that hatred of, of the uh, idols and the pagan uh, religions is rooted in that anxiety and fear of what God would do. So now we move on to Jeremiah. We've studied Jeremiah uh, in the last book. It says there's little question that the four decades during which Jeremiah lived marked the most tumultuous and tragic period in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah. By its end, the temple lay in ruins, along with much of the rest of Israel's walled city, and many of its citizens carted off to, the, to Babylonian exile. I hope you're getting the, this pattern that Israel is constantly being bombarded, constantly in threat of being invaded. Uh, foreign dominance, the author says, or Richard Brown, this is actually from Richard Brown, our last book, Foreign dominance shifted from the Assyrians, who years before conquered the kingdom of Israel in the north, to the Egyptians briefly, and then to the newest superpower, Babylon. Tiny Judah had the misfortune of being located geographically in the midst of all that. So Judah's collective memory of the past glory days and a persistent theological belief that Yahweh would protect them from any and all threats, that was the danger. Somehow they believed that they were immune uh, to any of the, the, the uh, dangers that surrounded them in that time period. And Jeremiah is trying to tell them that's not the case. That God will not always suffer, be a long-suffering God. So in 604, uh, the year of Nebuchadnezzar's ascension, the prophet Jeremiah revived the iconoclastic Destruction, and that, that stands for destruction of beliefs or institutions, perspective by, of, Isaiah, of Isaiah. So he, he renewed that and turned from this God who would always tri triumph and the chosen people would always triumph. He turned it on his head and sa said that God was using Babylon uh, to punish Israel. And it was now Israel's turn to be put under the ban, and they would have 70 years of exile ahead of them. So he's again is warning them of impending doom. Uh, and Jeremiah says, then the Lord reached out his hand and uh, to my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and, uh, and uh, tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So... Um, Bad times are coming, but there's still the chance of Israel. That was the sign of hope that Israel uh, and Judah would, in the end, be uprooted, but they would also, and, and destroyed, overthrown, but they would also have a chance to build and to plant and to renew. I, I like this passage because it, to me, it, uh, epitomizes Jeremiah's message to the people. And he says, uh, start each day by dealing with justice. 
rescue victims from their exploiters. This is God's message. Attend to matters of, of justice. Set things right between people. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Don't take advantage of the homeless, the orphans, the widows. Stop the murdering. So there is now, in essence, a new covenant. It's not that God will protect, protect Israel and Judah forever from alien, uh, from foreign uh, intervention. The, the new uh, way in which you sacrifice to God is by dealing with your fellow man justly and with wisdom. A great summary of the worth of all persons. Yep. Listen to God's message, he says. And this is Isaiah, one of the paintings about, uh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah. I'm getting my prophets mixed up. This is a painting of Jeremiah that I, I like. And so I thought I'd share. Okay, there, the author talks about the axial age. And in that, she, she, uh, she indicates that the duty of, to compassion, the duty to perform compassionately with others becomes the hallmark of all the major religions formed in the Axial Age. So anybody wonder what the Axial Age is? I have. And? What's the answer? <laughs> well, I thought you had an answer. No, you asked if I wondered, I wondered. Okay, well. It must be some sort of turning point in thinking. Yes. Yes, it's a concept by uh, philosopher uh, Carl J Jaspers, and he, uh, he calls that time period from the 8th to the 3rd century BCE as the Axial Age. And the whole concept was that he saw philosophers and thinkers in different communities around the world uh, basically coming to uh, common, common thoughts common ideas about uh, humanity and how humanity, humanity should behave. He points out that simultaneously and independently in China, India, Persia, Judea, and Greece, those foundations were established. And again, it's that, that foundation, the thing we're talking about is that there's a duty uh, of compassion for other people. Okay? God's not going to wipe out nations for us. Our duty is to be compassionate, loving, caring people who take care of the poor and the needy and the displaced, etc. The Yahweh of the actual axial age was still the God of angel armies, no longer just a mere God of war. So, you know, that compassion was overlaid when you read uh, through uh, Jeremiah and Amos and Isaiah, that uh, God of angel armies is still there. But he's, he's overlaid with this God of compassion and that the real emphasis, the real need for worship is to be compassionate to each other, um, not to um, destroy everybody who doesn't believe the way you believe. Hey, Jonathan. Yes. Why do you think that the Axial Age religion was so patriarchal? Because, I mean, there were times when our author talks about how um, the feminine version of gods was, they tried to keep it, especially the women tried to keep it a while. There was, this, there was Sophia, you know, in the wisdom of, uh, in uh, the book of Solomon. But it just seems like all of the men were just taken over during this time. And I just, I just can't figure out why. How did the women lose all their power? <laughs> well... I mean, I think the author mentions that the role changed as people moved more and more from agrarian societies into the cities, that it became more of a, a need for builders uh, and uh, hard labor, and that that gave men a more of an advantage, and women gradually became uh, constrained to be the homemakers, the, the mothers, uh, and that somehow that trans translated into God must be a man. God must be masculine. Um, and you got to remember that Yahweh did away with uh, Azeroth and a number of the other goddesses. 
And so obviously Yahweh was more powerful and um, it um, probably the age old masculine myth that men are stronger than women, that men are stronger, are smarter than women. And again, I would say that is the age old myth <laughs> of our society. So. Okay, that makes sense actually. Well, when the goddess goddesses were eliminated into, you know, that's kind of the change in emphasis or change in the um, power line to me. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, uh, Yahweh was a god of war. He was a god of vengeance initially, and that tended to be more of a masculine trait. And Asherah was the goddess of for fertility. So it's yes. more like that agrarian agrarian society, like you said. So it's not needed as much. Right. Interesting. Well, it also goes still goes back to, to Adam and Eve that uh, woman came from man. So yeah, but that know. was yeah, that was the Jews decided to write that story that way. <laughs> that, yeah, ex exactly. It was the Jewish mythology. That's used that's used as the justification for an awful lot of stuff. Yeah. True. Yeah. Sure. Well, in the book, I mean, they mentioned this guy. Uh, I say this guy, writer, the, the P, uh, they call it the P. And J. Uh, P and J. You know, P was the priestly and J was, was that Jehovah? Judges. Judges, I think. Judges. Yeah, well, Jay was the Yahwist. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, the, yeah. He the was the Jahwist. And then you've got the pre priestly and the Deuteronomy. Yeah, well, the one with the P version, that was in the time frame he was in, he was writing back, rewriting the history long ago and then coming up with this explanation of Adam and Eve. In Genesis, I um, the, generally speaking, those it's uh, it's the four Pentateuch sources that are some people buy and some people don't. I mean, so it's it's a theory that that the Pentateuch was written by four different individuals, um, and um, and their views were different. In fact, even their reference to God was different. Uh, some referring to him as uh, Yahweh and others as uh, Elohim. So anyhow, moving on, since I see we have about five or six minutes left, uh, throughout history of Christianity, the experience of God and Christ has taken on new forms. This is, again, the author talking about, uh, for instance, Rudolf Otto, early 20th century German theologian, attempted to describe the basic ways of experiencing the transcendence of the, or the numinous the spiritual dimension. And I, I like these terms, although I can't say them very well, so I will just use the English translation and say, he saw the holy, the experience with God, as taking on two forms. One is mystery that repels, and the other is mystery that attracts. And the repels is that dreadful, fearful, vengeful God view, and the one that attracts is the human um, that... Uh, the glory of God, the beauty, the adorable quality, the blessings, the redeeming, the salvation power, uh, uh, salvation bringing power of, of God. And uh, he goes on to say that, uh, it, it, this is talking about Otto, says that basically uh, it demonstrated in the ever new experiences of uh, charismatic leaders. And when I read that, I thought of, of Joseph Smith, you know, and uh, how he, he truly viewed uh, both a uh, God of mystery and a God uh, that, that repels and a God that attracts. And I, you know, I think that describes our charismatic leader in our, our movement. Monotheistics. Oh, this is the part where we talk about women. And we've already covered most of it. But uh, so the author says monotheistic monotheist would insist that God transcended gender, yet he would remain essentially male 
though we shall see that some would try to remedy this, this imbalance. In part, this was due to the origins as a tribal god of war. And it, the author does go on and talk about in, in the early days, women were forceful and clearly saw themselves as equals of their husbands and quotes uh, or mentions people like Deborah and Judith uh, and Esther and others that were, um, were strong individuals. So uh, the cult of the goddesses would be superseded and this would be a symptom of a cultural change that was characteristic of the new civilized world. And that's what I was trying to refer to earlier about the move from more agrarian to uh, cities and that that put men in a position where they could go out and work, they could do the hard labor, et cetera. And women were uh, uh, keeping the home fires burning. I, like, I liked her language that she said that this religion would be managed by men. <laughs> yes. yes. I thought that was funny, funny words, you know, that they're in management now. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> and the author comment says, instead of making God a symbol to challenge our pre prejudice and force us to contemplate our own shortcomings, it can be used to endorse our egotistic hatred and make it absolute. It makes God behave exactly like us. And this is the part I thought was interesting. It makes God behave exactly like us as though he were simply another human being. Such a God is likely to be more attractive and popular than the God of Amos and Isaiah, who demands ruthless self-criticism. Reactions to that? I agree. I think the whole point of a religious life should be to contemplate your own success and your own shortcomings. And I think too often we think we've arrived and we've taken care of it all and we're done. I think you've all heard the phrase, uh, the man has created God in his own image. And that can be viewed negatively or positively. The positive is that we see, we have, in some way we have to relate to that terrible, infinite universalness that we can't describe and we can't understand. And so I think starting all the way back with the pagan followers all the way through, we, we call him father, we call him God, we, uh, we, in whatever way we can, we try to humanize him so we have some way of understanding that great, immense, uh, unfathomable uh, being that is, is God. So the sense of an imminent God helped Jews to see humanity as sacred. Rabbi Akiva, and I, I like this story, uh, this quote, taught that the mitzvah, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, was the greatest principle of Torah. And I, I suspect many of us would say the great commandments of Jesus are the, are the essence of our, our beliefs, you know, that we, we honor and love God and we love our, our neighbors. Offenses, and this, I like this, offenses against a fellow human being were a denial of God himself who had made men and women in his image. It was tantamount to atheism, a blasphemous attempt to ignore God. Thus murder was the greatest of all crimes because it was a sacrilege. Scripture instructs us that whosoever sheds human blood is regarded as if he had diminished the divine image. Somebody should have told the, the crusaders that. <laughs> And we are about one minute over time. So any quick questions or comments? I, I have one comment and that is sympathy and compassion for the instructors who teach the coming chapters. <laughs> yeah. Paul at one point last week said that he had spent more time preparing for that chapter, that class than for any other class he'd ever taught. Uh, I concur. 
outcome. Totally. And we have not even really covered the whole chapter. So I'm going to leave it to you to go back and read the rest of it. Uh, but I, the thing I wanted to be sure to cover was that transition of God from a plurality of gods that the pagans followed to the God of war, uh, to the God, uh, God of the chosen people, to this God that expects compassion and uh, for us to love our neighbors. I think that goes along, Jonathan, with what she said about the need for religion to, or for, for our concept of God to evolve toward a God that's more personal and loving and, and caring that, you know, people after a time, they don't like the distant God or the cruel God or the angry God. Uh, they, they wanted to go back to the gods that kind of filled their everyday lives with meaning and purpose and, and blessing. And that's exactly where uh, Jesus took us, uh, was back to an understanding of, of a, a God that was close to us. I wondered too, uh, you talked about the story of the rabbi, and I like that a lot as well. Um, where, where did the saying, uh, when people say the God in me greets the God in you, where did that come from? Does anybody know? I don't know, but I've heard it. I don't remember. I'll have to Google it. <laughs> Is that something from from the Hindu or? I, well, that was, was my Hindu, thought, yeah. but I don't know that for certain. I'm trying to I think just, of the word. Namaste. Namaste. That's kind of the same concept, and I like that idea. Mm -hmm. I do too. I also understand Amy Jill Levine's frustration when she talked about how, you know, a lot of Christians say that the Old Testament is just about the angry God and the warrior God. And, and it, it's, it's much broader than that. I think sometimes as Christians, we pigeonhole the Old Testament into the angry God when there was actually a whole lot more to God than that. And I, I like learning that it's a little bit different than, than just my traditional viewpoint. I would be interested to in hear what she has to say, since she is a Jew, of what she thinks of Jews as the chosen people now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot, the chosen ones. Yeah, and has their understanding evolved? I imagine it has. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that uh, I kept thinking all the way through is, is similar to what Jane referenced, is that she basically was saying God was not vengeful. God and the Jews were a compassionate people, that they cared for, for each other. That, you know, the whole concept of uh, when you uh, harvest your grain, you leave some for the widow and the poor, uh, that that was uh, incorporated early on into, uh, into Judaism. And I, I think it's, it makes more sense when I read what I've read in this chapter, because you see the evolution. She's, she's describing um, the time of Amos and Isaiah uh, and Jeremiah and their approach of a compassionate Judaism and compassionate God. Uh, she, and we, when we talk about a vengeful God, we're really talking more about the time of Joshua and Moses and, you know, et cetera. So they're, they're, they're on a path, too. When you read the Old Testament, they're on a journey, just like Mark Shearer's books about the journey of a people. They went through a journey too, and you can't judge a people based on where they started. Hopefully, you judge them by where they ended. And I, we have to remember too, the Old Testament covers a lot of years, <laughs> you know, generations of people. So there was a big curve in understanding the natural world and understanding God that was taking place over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, and with that, yes, go ahead. Was there one more comment? Uh, what stuck with me is that chosen is not a privilege, it's a responsibility. Right. Yes. Right. I think we all agree with that. Well, we are uh, past our closing time. So I'm going to close this down. And uh, thank you all for joining me for class this morning. <laughs>